three, two, one. Welcome to the David the Dog Trainer Podcast, episode one fourteen. Hey. We had a little bit of a break. I know everybody's been like, "Where's the podcast? Where's the podcast, bro?" And I think it's been what two weeks? Or no? Did we do one last week? Yeah, yeah, oh, we, we did, did with Ava. Last. Oh yeah, Eva, Eva, Eva. Not Eva. Sorry, Eva. <laughs> <laughs> before that, though, it was like a week and a half or two weeks before the last one. We yeah. just had some lull. We've had some. Some some gaps, yeah. I would say. It, it, it's my fault. I was sick. It's Sorry, fine. Everyone. It's no big deal. I feel like in the last four... Because, yeah, okay. Getting my timeline right here. Yeah, so it's it's been like really like four weeks since we've done a podcast that's been like a... We're just chatting it out. We're talking about things, stuff like that. Yeah. That isn't like a guest podcast or like a reaction video like we did on the last couple. That's true. Yeah. And I feel like I've got eight gazillion things to talk about. It's been a wild last month, I would say. Mm -hmm. um, just a lot of stuff. Just stuff. Okay. You know? Yeah. There's just been a lot of stuff. Yeah. <laughs> And um, I'm trying to get my brain to work to actually remember all those things. Because, like, I texted you multiple times. I was like, I feel like I have so many things to talk about. You did. But here's the problem. And this is something I need to start doing is I need to start using the notes section on my phone, which I use very regularly for, like, to-do lists and stuff like that. But I need to start putting in bullet point talking points for the podcast. Oh, yeah. Right? And, and I'm taking a page from our Miracle Canine Staff podcast, which, by the way, now is, I think, 11 episodes in. They're crushing it. It's looking good. I'm thinking about, first off, side note, with that one, audio quality is going to be improving soon. I'm thinking about setting up a little actual podcast setup for them at the facility to start doing mm -hmm. so that it sounds a little bit more. A little, a little nicer. A little bit more. <laughs> <clears throat> I want to hear all the all the mouth noises mm, yeah. and all the the the, the inflection yeah. of the voice what they, what, what and all that? of that asmr is that what they call yeah. it hey, hey. Yes. miracle canine podcast i want i want the dynamics i want it all but anyways i got to yeah. take a, a a page from their book which i think if i'm not mistaken they got a little group chat thing with each other Ooh. where they just ping pong little ideas okay. back and forth yeah, you yeah. know and uh, so that they're all prepared and ready. And I'll give them credit, man. They are way more on top of shit than we are as far as their podcast from the standpoint of like they go in prepared. They have their <laughs> topic outlined every week. They got their bullet points. They get right into it. Yeah. Yeah. And there's no fucking bullshitting around with it. So listen, <laughs> you know, go check out that podcast if you haven't already. Miracle Canine Staff Podcast. I've been posting all of them in the Apple Podcast and the Spotify Podcast section of this podcast. You'll see them all under bonus episodes. Mm. Um, and um, obviously on YouTube as well. We've been posting them. And they're going to start doing a little bit more with like engaging with you. So if you're leaving comments on their posts and stuff, you know, I generally reply to all the YouTube comments, but I'm going to, in addition to that, start forwarding all of those comments over to them so they can start talking about them on the podcast as well. Mm -hmm. See if we can grow that one up a little bit also. Dang. We're going to have to change it from Miracle Canine Training to Miracle Canine Media at this point. Dude, we, just just, got, we got podcasts everywhere. Yeah. We're just slinging it out. Hours and hours and hours Dude, of content. Podcast. We got a dog vlog. I mean, it's just... I, I don't know, man. I just think we're, we're fucking cranking out media. Yeah? I strive to be just the realest dog trainer on the internet. I think if mm. I really had to break it down, <clears throat> I want to be the realest one. Meaning... Listen, the the nice put together videos and the DIY this and that and blah, blah, blah. Like, we got some of that. It's fine. But I'm just trying to just show y'all what it actually is. <laughs> show y'all. And that's yeah. a part of the reason why these last couple of weeks have been so fucking crazy is because we got some clients, man, that we're working with in some tough situations, man. And, mm -hmm. Tough, tough tough situations you know a mm -hmm. lot of a uh, lot of a in we've been dealing with a decent amount of inner household aggression issues right whether that is fighting dogs we've been working with a lot of fighting dogs lately really or whether that's handler aggression which is mm -hmm. we don't see a ton of it there really isn't that much handler aggression meaning the dog is acting aggressively towards the owners basically Mm -hmm. Right. And those, man, those two types of issues, right? House fighting, like dogs fighting with each other in the house and household, like inner household aggression issues towards owners are the single most challenging things you could experience with your dog, I think. 
Like you just mm-hmm. can't because you can't avoid them. Any other yeah. behavioral issue aside from that, your dog could be the most human aggressive dog in the world or the most dog aggressive dog in the world towards strangers or your guests or things like that. Mm-hmm. You always can just go put them away and just not have to fucking deal with it. True. When you got a dog that's acting aggressively towards you, you can't really escape that <laughs> no. one. When you have dogs that are fighting with other dogs in the house, you could crate and rotate, but that creates a shit ton of extra work on you, right? And mm-hmm. there are so many little variables that can go wrong. Yeah. So many. I can't even imagine that, dude. So many. As somebody who's dealt with it myself with the fighting dogs, right? Yeah. It is there's a lot of a lot of management that goes into play as you're working through things, right? Mm-hmm. And and maybe next episode, I don't know if we ever really deep dove into like my situation with my dogs that I dealt with when they used to fight with each other and like how I overcame that. Maybe next episode we'll like really deep dive into that because there's a lot of kind of nuanced details and stuff that go into that situation and how we ultimately resolved it and why those dogs are just right now while we're filming this podcast just chilling outside lounging in the sun together <laughs> with my wife right yeah. and are cool now right but yeah. there there was so much management that went into play with that yeah I, and, we've only um, talked about it i don't think we ever actually got into detail yeah we've we've i we've touched on the subject obviously but we'll deep dive into that maybe maybe next week that'd be cool yeah yeah, yeah. uh but yeah a lot of lot of situations a lot of uh in addition to the the client side of things and the dogs we're working with a lot of really interesting talking points have been coming up in the comments you guys have really really been doing an awesome job like engaging with our content on youtube specifically like youtube has really created a cool community at this point Mm -hmm. we got a lot of people asking really good questions really really engaging and just providing smart good dialogue and, and there's one thing that I did reassure somebody in the comment section that I was going to talk about on the podcast like four weeks ago that I haven't yet because we haven't had an opportunity to do it. That is what I want to make the primary focus of today's episode, right? Okay. And basically, the overall topic of this is energy level and managing energy level of your dogs in the house, right? And, and basically, where this was sparked from is in two episodes ago when we were talking about and watching the um, the how to teach your dog not to pull on the walk, in one of the Beckman videos, he was doing the release and then like correcting with the the leash for being too energetic with the, the with the release, and it was it was really confusing and it created some really interesting comments and commentary in the comment section, obviously, and we started kind of debating it a little bit and discussing the whys and uh, you know what we disagree with it or like about it or any of those types of things. And somebody provided some really interesting commentary on it. So what I'm going to do to start here, hang on. Let's pull up the tape. Yeah, hold on, hold on, hold on. Bear with me a second. Is I want to read the comment exchange Mm -hmm. that we had. Okay. Oh, Jesus freaking Christ. (laughs) All right, all right, all right. I got to bring this over here. This is going to be, this is going to be too much to read from that TV. All right, let me pop this piece off. (laughs) <laughs> okay <laughs> too small for you all right so so oh my god i don't know what's going on right now he's having it he's he's having i'm having a tough place. time over here guys <laughs> did you get it over there i think i did you okay somehow i shrank everything a little bit <laughs> okay all right here we go you need that uh old person where the the text is real big yep okay so this was an exchange with uh uh somebody who's been commenting quite a bit lately and, and providing some really, really good talking points on, on some subjects here, right? So, so to give everybody the context, so in the Beckman video, he was doing something where he was essentially releasing the dog, kind of enticing the dog to go off, and then correcting the dog when the dog did go off, right? Okay. My opinion on that was it was confusing. I didn't understand what the release was, right? Because he was implying it wasn't really a release, but that, whatever. You could watch the, the podcast episode to hear that whole kind of dialogue of my opinions on that, obviously. Mm. But... Um, basically I'll just read what this person commented on it here. So she said, writing as I watch here, uh, Beckman was actually one of the first people I saw when my dog was having issues with threshold on the leash. I didn't find it terribly confusing. My okay release was always a calm release, even before our general leash manners. Okay. Doesn't mean we get to be a maniac. Okay. Means we're calm and we're checking in because my dog, she's uh, something is going on here, man. Um, do, 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 do. 
because my dog, she's small, fast, prey-driven, and can do a lot of damage if you let her decide for herself, especially at that time. She'll always be that kind of dog, but now she's in a place where her default is calm and attentive, and I could use other ways to communicate that it's her turn to be a dog and go as hard as she can in the appropriate activities that we do together. YouTube has really opened up dog training for me. The more I looked, the more there was. There were so many sports and activities I had no idea existed. There's so much to learn from all kind of people. And most importantly, now the average person, including myself, can stay up to date as we know more. Now with my very first dog, that's not a family dog, I'd say I got it more right than I could have ever hoped for 10 years ago. Okay, so... Basically, what she's implying here is what a lot of people think, and I see a lot of trainers train, right? Which I understand, right? The idea here is that when we release our dog, so let's say I put my dog in a bed stay and I release them off of position, right? Yep. That I still expect a degree of calm, mm. right? Now, we'll debate why I think that that's faulty and why I think that that's very confusing and in a lot of cases, a double standard for dogs yeah. and how I go about combating the issue. Because obviously there's times we do, we would like for the dog to be calmer, mm -hmm. right? But it's a difficult thing to communicate clearly and this method creates a lot of problems, I believe, right? Yeah. So I'll just kind of read the rest of the exchange here, obviously. So what I said next, I said... Glad that's all worked out for you. The only thing I care about is that we have consistent meaning behind the words we use. I was highly confused because he said the meaning of okay is that the dog can only go three feet from you. That would mean it isn't a release. It's telling the dog there is an expectation you have of them still. Then later in the video, that was changed when he told the dog okay, and he went and got all the way to the end of the leash, sniffing to pee and not attentive or checking in. Past that, the method he's using in the video is tried and true. Many trainers use it, and it absolutely works, and I think if you look past my criticism of the okay, it absolutely will help someone to teach their dog better leash manners. Again, for that, if you want the context of that, watch the podcast episode we did on it. You'll understand the method he was using and why, generally, it was totally fine. This was just this point on the okay, this individual point was a little confusing. Yep. Further, I went to say... My biggest thing as far as the okay is if we try to manage energy levels when released, which generally I'm not a fan of because it leads you into a dangerous territory of heavily micromanaging as opposed to treating why the dog is getting so amped in some of these unwanted areas. And I said, but that's a conversation for another time, which we'll get into a little bit today. Um, and you've ever used okay to release your dog to tear through a field or barrel into the backyard, you've immediately created a double standard that could be very, very confusing for dogs. Just a tangent that doesn't have much to do with him or you there, but how I feel about releases in general, right? Okay. So the yeah. issue with discussing energy levels or the issue with releasing and having an expectation of when you're on a leash, you have to stay within four feet of me still, mm -hmm. right? Is that it's no longer a release. What does a release mean? A release means you are free. free. There is no longer an expectation of you from an obedience standpoint, Yeah, right? Using it in those ways, there is an expectation of what the dog should still be doing. Mm -hmm. Further went to say, one last point to what you said. You mentioned that she's small, fast, prey-driven and can do a lot of damage if you let her decide for herself. I would challenge to assume that instead of the expectation be be calm when released, you were likely trying to get her to not do other things when releasing. Example, when released, she got excited, then chased the squirrel. When released, she got too excited, then clawed up grandma by jumping all over her. When released, she got too excited and then tried to dig a hole under the fence, et cetera, et cetera. Just examples. Where in a lot of those cases, the arousal or excitement when being released was not the problem. The problem was that when they got excited, she couldn't control herself and rehearsed unwanted behaviors. My solution is a little opposite than a lot of people. I don't want to remove the arousal. That's who the dog is. Like you said, I want to teach the dog to control their arousal. All this to say, in all these examples, the release is still a release. It means you are free to do anything you want to do aside from rehearse 
behaviors that you're never allowed to rehearse regardless of how excited you are and regardless of if you're in command or not. Mm. Right? Yep. So <clears throat> further what to say, um, great talking point. This is going to be a topic of my next podcast. This was two weeks ago. We're now getting to it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <clears throat> um, so, so her reply to it, obviously, and then we'll start really breaking this down. She said, so at the time, I think I definitely didn't have the skill set because I didn't think of just not removing the arousal. I could see that as a possibility for a lot of pet dogs now that you say it. So when I mean destructive, I mean more dangerous for the dog and anyone in the way. In the, if I throw a ball off a cliff, my dog is going off the cliff too kind of way. But I guess my question would be, especially, and this is where it really got interesting, I thought. Mm. But I guess my question would be, especially since you're a mal owner, how does it apply to highly driven dogs? And then on top of that, how can you manage it without micromanaging a high driven dog? That is also not balanced like a well-bred, purpose-bred dog would be. I think that would be cool to talk about. It feels like in that scenario, the line to cross between arousal and absolute chaos is real thin <laughs> unless the owner has been with and trained dogs for 10 plus years. What happens when everything they do is at 110%? Not necessarily a bad behavior, but more like being the canine embodiment of the Kool-Aid man while doing perfectly <laughs> normal things is a lot. <laughs> and I mostly ask this because, you know, the mostly mellow golden retriever that pulls hard is what was shown. A lot of good dogs just doing normal dog things. So while we're watching the Golden Retriever on the screen, a lot of people end up in these spaces looking at this because they have something with more zest than what they bargained for or a different flavor of zest. So with my dog specifically, oh man, this is a long one. I don't know if I remember all this. <laughs> so with my dog specifically, when I was first training her, I dialed everything back to zero and made it so the only expectation was to just stop. You know how if you ask the dog to do something, but they're not sure what you want, so they perform different behaviors until they get it, right? If she doesn't know what to do or she is confused about something, now she'll just lay down instead of ping-ponging at hyper speed, which was her biggest issue. A lot of her issues were from four months of being a feral puppy and spending a week in foster before I got her. Fear, lack of competence, confidence, some dominance in genetics, poorly bred, heavy on the true American pit bull terrier. In that order, I'm sure a lot of people share this same story with their dogs, especially dogs from sketchy backgrounds. She's two now and fantastic. Man, this is a long one. She's two now and fantastic. I still have to stop during certain types of training and play or she'll literally choose to kill herself from exhaustion. So I have to pay close attention to when she's tired before she knows she's tired. I think I wish the most of my dog or I think I wish the most from dog training YouTube was hard was how hard it was for me to find out how to let my dog be a dog in appropriate ways. The next step to when we're done having them heal at the park when they don't react anymore. When we figure out what we can break out figure out that we can break out a toy and it doesn't have to be training time all the time. I had to dig real deep for uh, to find that kind of information and get to the place where it's less micromanagey. I'm glad you brought that up. And more, actually enjoying your dog time. I think the first time I heard it really was with Andy Kruger and his video of him just playing tug with his dog. No rules, no commands, just playing tug for five minutes. My mind was blown, and it feels like such a silly thing to go, duh, that's what I'm looking for. So to circle back... To my okay being a calm release and not a full release, someone taught me about using equipment as the expectation. Okay from her place is a calm release. Okay from a leash is a calm release. Same with when I open the back door or car door or even on a hiking trail with a flexi lead. The energy needs to be dialed back. Her full release is when I bring out the e-collar. Because that means we're going to go do something fun and off lead. And she could go as fast as she wants, which is very, very fast. She learns fast, and she was still young, so it took about a year. That's not to say she spent a year on the couch, lol. With her energy and mental needs, she almost she needs almost daily work, but she's stable and reliable now. Sorry that was super long, but I love these topics, and I live for uh, learning more and what I could do better. I'm excited for the next podcast. My dog, I want to be a sporting prospect, and I think the way you describe it was super beneficial. Um... And then she said a little bit later, side note, I'm having a big old think about it. And yeah, the okay at the door or the okay. And then the okay to go sniff and pee is still weird. Uh, 
whatever that he talked about, obviously he think he had a, 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 a different video somewhere discussing the differences or something like that, whatever. Okay. So a lot of reading, a lot of interesting yeah. stuff there, obviously lot, yeah. long comment. Listen, I appreciate the long comments, right? Mm -hmm. This gives me great things to talk about here, yeah, right? Keep them up. And this is a really good topic to discuss here. Mm -hmm. Okay. So <laughs> let me catch my breath. There's a lot of reading. <laughs> Got to catch my breath for a second here. <clears throat> Take a sip of my coffee. <laughs> Gotta hydrate the throat. There you go. Okay. So so let's start breaking this down here, right? So so in order to talk about this, what we need to do is we need to one talk about realistic expectations with mm -hmm. some things. Two, we need to talk about definitions for all of the things that we do so we have a yeah. clear standard we could hold the dog to. And three, we need to talk about how arousal can be created and also decreased organically. Yeah. Right? So let's start with clearly outlining the expectation of some of our things. So what does okay mean? Right? Okay simply means you are free. Specifically, I always say if you look at commands and stuff, a lot of people sandwich okay into a command. Okay is not a command. Okay is similar to your marker words that you use. Yes and no, right? Those aren't commands either. Those are things you use to identify stuff. Yeah. So okay specifically marks the end of whatever thing the dog is currently engaging in, right? So yeah. let's say I tell a dog heal, right? When I tell a dog heal, and I tell them, okay, what I am doing is effectively marking the end of the heel command. Okay. Right? Mm -hmm. Meaning there's no expectation until I ask them to do something else. Yep. Right? If I put the dog in a bed command, okay marks the end of that bed command. Right? So it says something about what you were doing before, but it doesn't say anything about what you should be doing after. Mm. Right? Yep. <clears throat> so... Here's my issue with all these different ways people are describing it, mm -hmm. right? Is the second you start creating these weird expectations of if you're on a bed and I tell you, okay, it's a calm release. That was something that was said many times. My question for everybody that says that is what does that mean? How do you define that clearly? Okay. What is calm? <laughs> right? Yeah. What is calm, right? For yeah. some people in some situations, calm is walking patiently off of the bed. Yeah. In some cases, it's running off of the bed, but not running full speed off of the bed. Yeah. In some cases, it might mean they hesitate on getting off and then slowly get off afterwards. Mm. And then my next question for you would be, do you think your dog is even remotely conscious of their energy level? And how do you define exactly what the appropriate cap to that energy level is to the dog? Hmm. You cannot. No. You literally can not. <laughs> right? Yeah. And here's my problem, right? We look at all the places we use a release, right? If your dog is waiting for their food, we use a release to tell them they can go eat it. If you're letting your dog into the backyard, you use your release to tell the dog that they could go into the backyard. If you are um, 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 letting your dog come out of the car, you could use it to let them come out of the car, mm -hmm. right? All of those different situations are going to have different energy levels. Mm -hmm. When I tell my dogs, okay, at their food bowl, <laughs> they go 150% energy level full bore to that food bowl because they are really, really amped up to get it, right? Yeah. The association of what they are going to get, there's so much anticipation behind it that they just railroad right into it, mm -hmm. right? When I go let them into the backyard in the morning to go to the bathroom, right? They are flying out into that backyard. Right. Oh, yeah. If I'm getting out of the car and I'm releasing them into a big open field to go run around, they're going right. If I've been healing with them at the park and we get to the spot where then they can go run and chase their chuck it, they are going full bore to go chase that chuck it. Mm -hmm. Right. So how are you going to tell the dog to calm down in those situations? 
right? Mm -hmm. Or if you're going to use it in those situations and let them get all amped up, but then punish them for being amped up to get off of other situations, Mm. you've created a double standard. It does not make sense. Yeah. It does not make sense, right? And here's the other problem with it, right? I see people do this all the time. I see local trainers around here do this and talk about, if I release my dog from place and they got up all excited, I would correct them for it. So, so... I, I'm like trying to figure out clear ways to be able to explain how ridiculous of a concept that is, right? Mm-hmm. Because <sighs> if I needed my dog to do something specific, I wouldn't use a release for that. Mm-hmm. I just wouldn't, right? Yeah. So let's take the example, one of the examples she described, right? When she gets out of the car at the park, right? Right? If you don't want the dog to come out and go flying all over the place, give the dog a command, right? Mm-hmm. So so we could use okay, or we could use something like come or heal in that mm-hmm. context, right? Yeah. Where the dog comes out of the car and there is an expectation of them in that moment. And if they didn't comply with that expectation in that moment, I could give a correction for that, that the dog would clearly understand, yeah. Right? Mm-hmm. So so I do this with my dogs literally all the time. We get to the park to go hiking or something like that. I open the car door. They're waiting. I don't release them out of it. Mm-hmm. I put them into another command, right? So there's multiple ways to release a dog from a position. You could release a dog from a position with a release, or you could release them into another command. You could use yeah. another command to effectively end the thing you were doing before and mm-hmm. start something else, right? Yeah. So, so Beckman's method at the doorway, when he was telling the dog okay and the dog would run ahead and then he punished the dog for it, right? Yeah. Just tell the dog heal there instead, instead right? Mm-hmm. If you still want the dog next to you, yeah. just give the dog the command that means stay next to me. <laughs> yeah. Like I, I, don't get what's, I don't get what's so complicated about that, right? It's not, no. <clears throat> and, and then you further get into this concept, right, of, of she was kind of asking the question here of, Well, if you have a high drive dog that does everything at 120% energy, right? Mm -hmm. How do you handle that, right? And there's two parts to that conversation, right? Part number one is if you have a high drive dog, you will not change who that dog is. When I ask Vinny to do things, Vinny does things at 120%, (laughs) right? If I don't want him to do that, Oh well, yeah. <laughs> I got a mouth. I literally, I have a mouth. Yeah, you knew what you got. You know what I mean? Do. We talked a lot last time about like uh, Vishlas, right? In yeah. German short, short hair pointers, which yeah. are like Energizer bunnies. Yeah. I think Eva said, right? Yeah, which they are, right? Mm-hmm. If you don't want your dog to do everything with 120 percent energy, you shouldn't have gotten that breed. Yeah, right. So instead of trying to turn the dog into something that they're not, all that does is create more frustration for both yourself as well as for the dog, right? Which creates more stress, which creates more arousal. Yeah. So you're further compounding on the problem that you're having Mm -hmm. and you're making it worse. Furthermore, right? If we try to micromanage energy levels constantly Mm -hmm. with dogs like that, all you're doing is you're taking them and you're like, you're taking that spring and just, Compressing it. And then finally, when you do give them that option to go tear, like she said, the e collar means I go tear, right? Which that's a whole other conversation of we don't want to create equipment cues, right? If we want our dog's behavior to be consistent overall across the board, we do not want to create an association that the e collar goes on means something is different. We want our dog's behavior to stay consistent across the board, yeah, right? Which again, that's a whole other conversation that we would have to get into, obviously, right? Mm -hmm. But when you do finally go to release them, that spring is just going to freaking explode even more intensely, and your Mm -hmm. dog's behavior is going to be even harder to manage than at that point. Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. So how do we combat these things, right? Because I do, I I am empathetic to there are times the energy level is fucking annoying. I get it. Yeah. I totally get it, right? Um, And that's where you have to look at the deeper why behind why the dog is doing the thing that they're doing, right? Mm -hmm. Once you have checked the box that, and, and again, a lot of conversations in that. Like, it's really hard to kind of break down all of the, <laughs> the the individual points that she said. Yeah. But but another point that she said was like, you know, how do you get to a place? What's the end goal, right? Once you you provide all of this structure that everybody says to do, right? 
and and you 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 train the dog and you use your training all the time to create structure and it's constantly do this do this do this do this be calm here be calm here do this do that right what's the next goal because that's a, a really really annoying stressful life to have to live with a dog of like I'm constantly giving direction giving direction giving direction giving direction right oh yeah and my motto you guys have heard me say a million and one times is my end goal with my dogs <clears throat> is that I want to have to micromanage them as little as possible right yeah. I don't use commands very much with my dogs mm -hmm. genuinely right they are free to do whatever the fuck they want to do 99.9% .9 of the time and I only use my commands in situations where I need them to not be doing what they want to do not because they'd be doing anything wrong but it's just not an appropriate place to be doing it yeah. right which further gets to associations and how we combat associations right <clears throat> so I gotta catch my breath again here. <laughs> We're going all over the place with this one, and I hope you guys are following along and able to catch up on this kind of stuff because this is a very important topic here right now, mm -hmm. right? So, right? Commands are to manage the dog when they're not doing something wrong. So first thing we want to look at is when the dog is free, when I'm not giving any direction, right? What things does the dog do that I don't want them to do, right? I use the example many times. Digging holes, chasing animals, jumping on people indoors, yeah. right? Getting into things that they're not supposed to, this, that, whatever, mm -hmm. right? Any of those types of things, you guys have to just correct for that stuff. Stop correcting for your dog's energy level. Stop asking them to do commands in those moments. When you're hanging out in your house, right? Mm -hmm. And your dog does something that you don't want them to do, right? That's not energy related. That's yeah. just that behavioral issue I do not want you to do. Yeah. Don't use commands to stop that problem. Correct, correct the dog for that thing so it goes away so mm -hmm. they learn more specifically what it is that you expect out of them so you could further get to a place where you don't need to give structure, yeah. right? When our dog is free all the time, right, or free 90% of the time, right, you don't have this ping pong of back and forth of like bottle it in, explode it out, <clears throat> bottle it in, explode it out, bottle it in, explode it out right? They create a baseline energy of not constantly expecting the big release, mm -hmm. right? And instead, just being calm and chill of just, if I want to go walk into the kitchen to go get the water bowl, I don't have to be released from this bed to go flying over to the water bowl. I could just go just to go. it whenever I want without having all that anticipation buildup, yeah. right? Um, uh, uh, et cetera, et cetera, right? Like that, that can go on, that can go on forever, right? So the first thing we need to do is that, right? Is we need to create a default where our dog can be free the majority of the time, yep. right? Now, in the situations where we do need to use commands, we need to ask ourselves the question of if there is going to be a problem with an energy level when I release the dog, I need to shift why the dog is so energetic to be released, mm -hmm. right? So let's take an example of... I, I don't even necessarily know if there was an exact example of where it was a problem, obviously, but... Let's say, hypothetically speaking, yeah, here, I'll give you a good example of a situation I ran into, right? So when I used to do Mondio Ring with Vinny, right, we would go train in fields all the time, right? Yeah. And when we went to go train in fields, something really freaking energetic and exciting happened, right? Yeah. He, we would get to that field, we'd go do bike work, we'd go play high energy tug games, ball, and, and train, and do these really high drive driven exercises. Yeah. So Vinny started to create an association of when we got to a field, even if he was in command, energy level just went through the fucking roof mm. because he was expecting for those things to happen. Yeah. And it hit a point where it was almost, and this was years and years ago, it was almost embarrassing because I would go near a field and he would just, he'd be in a heel position perfectly, but he'd be like, ah, ah, ah. he'd be like screaming and barking and just so fucking pumped yeah. up, right? And he's a Malinois, like that's what they do, you know what I mean? Mm. But that I determined to be appropriate. But... I knew correcting would not have, it didn't stop it. I, tr I tr When I was a, a younger trainer, I used to try to correct all that shit. The whining, the barking, everybody says, oh, don't let your dog make all this noise and this and that. It's like, he's a fucking dog, right? Like, yeah. he's, <laughs> he's a Malinois also. Like, that's the dog he is. Correcting that stuff only amped it up and made it worse because oh, he yeah. didn't know what those corrections were for because that energy was so mindless, mm -hmm. right? And all it did was frustrate him and make him even more freaking amped up every time we got to those places, right? Yeah. So I had to take a step back. I had to kind of reverse engineer. Why is he getting so excited every time we go to a field, 
He was because we did high energy, high drive games. So what did we do to combat that? I spent like four months going to fields and sitting at a picnic bench and doing a downstay. Mm. Or walking calmly through the field in a heel position for 20 minutes and then going home. And I made sure not one exciting thing happened in that environment. Mm -hmm. Right? And, excuse me, over time, what do you think happened? He chilled out. He chilled out. Yeah. We can go walk through a field and it can be real enjoyable and real nice and he don't get himself all fucking worked up. So it's disassociating that that want. Yes. Basically. Right. Let's look at another common one people struggle with, right? Chasing animals, right? Their dog mm-hmm. sees squirrels, they get too jacked up. They have no control over their dog, mm-hmm. right? But when they're in the backyard, what do they let the dog do all day long? Chase fucking squirrels. Yeah. Chase deer. Go for it. Go for it, right? Because there's a fence. They can't go any further, mm-hmm. right? So so what you're doing is, again, you're creating this double standard of I'm telling you, right? Mm-hmm. In these places, you could go and do that. But in these places, I get mad at you for doing that. Yeah. And yes, in that place, even if I give if I give the dog a heel <laughs> command, it's expected they stay with me still. But why is the, why am I having such a hard time controlling the dog still in that moment? Because in the back of their mind, they really want to go chase that thing, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. And, and listen, there's there's this back and forth conversation of I'm not I'm not saying like don't ever let your dog chase animals or whatever. Like I don't do it, but it's not going to be the most detrimental thing in the world if you let your dog do it sometimes, right? Yeah. But I don't do it because I don't want my dog seeing squirrels or deer, and even if they're in the heel command, thinking in the back of their head that if I release them from position, go fucking bolting after that thing, mm-hmm. right? And because I don't do that at this stage, my dogs walk by that kind of stuff and they don't pay it much mind. It means nothing to them. There's never a source of excitement that comes from it right another example i'll give you guys a million examples with this kind of stuff of places i've dealt with this with my dogs right another example is uh when i used to go to my parents house right that was the place of also every good thing that could ever possibly happen (laughs) right so same deal i would go there and energy level was through the fucking roof Mm -hmm. through the goddamn roof because every time we went there my dad would take Vinny into the backyard and play chuck it with him and Vera would get to go run around with grandma in the backyard and do all these kinds of things and stuff like that. So what did I do? I started going there and I started instructing my parents, you need to leave the dogs alone for a little bit. They're just going to hold a down stay for a while. And I did that until the association of the place got to a more manageable level. And then we taught time and place for stuff, mm-hmm. right? So once they chilled out and I got them to settle down a little bit, maybe every now and then he can go play chuck it with them. But if it started becoming a problem where the energy level got too high, we reeled it back in again for a little bit. Yeah. Right? <sighs> Catch my breath again. <laughs> <clears throat> not used to doing so much talking. So I don't know if this is making sense or not, but like yeah. we need to start looking at this deeper than correct the dog for the thing. And this is this is where you get into a lot of trainers where they have issues with like other balance trainers, right? Like there's balance trainers that don't like other balance trainers because of how much they're constantly micromanaging and punishing dogs for things, mm, right? Yeah. And it's because we're not getting to another thing that this lady said in her her message, which is we're never letting the dog just be a dog and respecting who the dog is, right? Yeah. All my dogs 100%. are different. Vinny is going to do things at 110% energy sometimes, and I have to respect that, and I have to think three steps ahead of him sometimes and ask myself if this is not an appropriate place for him to do that. I, I can't just release him and correct him for stuff. Like I need to work on shifting his association with things. Right. Mm-hmm. There's times when people come over, like he gets really excited when people come over. Right. He's a fucking Malinois. Right. He runs over to the door to come mm-hmm. greet you and stuff like that. So I put him in a bed stay when people come in. Right. I don't correct him for being too excited when people are coming over. I use my commands to manage him yeah. and chill him out and shift his association of not every time people come over, you're getting all this attention and stuff right away. True. Right. Yeah. But every single thing that I ask them to do, because it has a very clearly defined meaning behind it. Mm -hmm. It's super specific, right? I can tell you without a question of a doubt that every one of my commands, markers, or releases is used in the exact same way every time. There's no double standards for any of it. Because of that, when I punish my dogs for things, they understand what it's for, and I don't have to do it again. 
where I bet you 99% of the people that do the similar thing like this, which oh, is yeah. the release and then the correct energy levels, they're constantly needing to correct the dog for being too energetic. Yeah. You just are. You're micromanaging too much, mm -hmm. right? And if you just slowed down and you just looked at why is my dog getting excited, let me shift their association a little bit here. Let me give them plenty of outlets where when I do actually tell them, okay, I let them just rip, right? And I try to move towards a life of having my dogs free 90% of the time so that I'm not constantly having these buildups of anticipation and excitement. Yeah. Everything will get better. Yeah. Everything will get better. 100%. <coughs> Jeez. This is a guy that tickled my throat. I think, <coughs> correct me if I'm wrong. And but, I'm getting fired up because yeah. I'm passionate, guys. Yeah, I'm not very, angry. Very I'm not passionate. yelling at who's, the, I don't even know who the person was that commented on this. What's her name? I don't know. I'm trying to look it up. I'm not sure. <laughs> Whatever. I'm not, I'm not mad at you. I'm not picking on you. I promise. Yeah. Like I said, this is a great talking point, but it is something that we really need to check ourselves with, I think, mm -hmm. and look at like, like this isn't a skill level thing. This has nothing to do with like, oh, well, you know, I think she had mentioned in one of the things like, you know, the, sometimes people don't have, and I'm not exactly sure what she was, she was saying with it, obviously, but you know, some people don't have 10 plus years of experience to be able to, to understand how to work through this stuff or whatever. This, this is not a, you need, you don't need any more skill in order to do things this way than any of the other ways. Zero yeah. more. This is just about understanding it differently. No yeah. different than you have to understand how to teach your dog how to do a bed stay in the first place mm -hmm. or any of that kind of stuff. You got to understand why your dog is doing the things that they're doing. I think that's very, 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 very important. Yeah. And I mean, that's exactly what I was basically going about to say, <clears throat> because especially when you said, you know, being over micromanaging and all this stuff, I think <laughs> in a nutshell, if you just need to take a step back and look at it way more simplistic. Way more simplistic. You know that, that is a good way to put it. 100%. You know, like, like not saying, you know, it's easy still, but it's like you're, you're trying to do way too many things that, like you said, is just confusing the dog at the end of the day. Oh, that is a really, really good way of putting it. Mm -hmm. And a way simpler way of saying all of the things that I just said, honestly, <laughs> is, is you just need to look at this in a more simplistic way yeah. of everybody looks at, my dog is doing this inappropriate thing. Like, again, like I would really love if I had a conversation with this person, I would ask them, right? What, when you got your dog, when you first started on this journey of trying to learn about training and stuff, mm -hmm. what were you trying to get your dog to not do? Yeah. What were you trying to get the dog to not do? Because there's always something that leads us down this path, right? Mm -hmm. It could be, and, and with most people, I think, it could be my dog was dog reactive. Yeah. Right. It could be that my dog was a psycho and jumped all over people and I just had so little control over them because their energy level was so high all the time. Mm -hmm. In addition to them rehearsing this, it was just chaos yeah. at all times. Yeah. Right. We see that so much. And what I would tell every single one of them, right? I would say, we need to just like 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 as you're looking at what's my solution, so many people say your dog needs structure. Mm. right the trainers need to stop saying that <laughs> yeah. honestly right yeah. or if they're gonna say it they need to say what that actually means what yeah. does your dog needs more structure mean mm -hmm. right because a lot of people make it sound like well because you're not constantly training your dog and because you're not constantly asking your dog to do things and because your dog is just not getting mental stimulation and stuff that's why they're doing those things which is yeah. not true i don't know it's not true it's not the reason why your dog is jumping on people. The reason why your dog is jumping on people is because the dog has not been punished for jumping on people. The reason yeah. why your dog is being dog reactive on a leash is because you're not punishing the dog for being dog reactive on a leash, et cetera, et cetera, yeah. et cetera, Rinse and repeat. et cetera. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. And subsequently, as we stop those things, the dog doesn't go to a level 120 all the time with things, most dogs, right? Yeah. Because the 120 level is the level they hit when they are they, they hit a point of mindlessness, mm. right? And the second that they can't be mindless anymore because they realize there's rules and consequences, they organically bring the energy level down a little bit. Yeah. And then let's say you stop the jumping on people, but they're still <clears throat> getting into things they're not supposed to, mm -hmm. right? You stop that thing, energy level comes down a little bit more, 
et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Then once you get to a place where the dog is no longer rehearsing anything that is an unwanted behavior, yeah. then you could look at if you're still having high levels of energy, why does the dog have high levels of energy in that situation? And you could reverse engineer those things to shift the dog's association so the energy level comes down even more. Yeah. And that's it. And that's mm -hmm. how you get a balanced dog that can just be a dog. Mm -hmm. Right? And then to her last point, which is, or which was, you know, <clears throat> I wish I still had this pulled up. Mother <laughs> frigger. Yeah, I can't remember off topic. Yeah. The, one of the last points was like, you know, like I want to just like be able to enjoy my dog sometimes. Yeah. And she saw an Andy Kruger who it, we haven't really talked about him a lot on the podcast. Andy Kruger, I believe is in like Kentucky or Cincinnati, somewhere around there. Okay. Good trainer. He's a sport dog trainer, mm. right? I think he's very big in the French <clears throat> ring world, mm. if I'm not mistaken. Um, okay. And don't, don't quote me on that. I'm, I'm almost positive. He's a big French ring guy, right? But, but he had a video where he was just playing tug with his dog, just having fun with them, right? Mm -hmm. Guys, have places where you could just let the dog be a dog. Yeah. You know what I mean? As you're working towards this goal. Yeah. Right? Like, like just understand, like, sometimes we get so far away from forgetting that these dogs are fucking dogs. Mm -hmm. We really do. And that's the whole point of training. Yeah. <laughs> In the funny. chase for perfection, sometimes, there was another comment that I thought was really good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Here we go. So, so somebody commented on one of the Miracle Canine staff podcasts and said, and, and this is a good good podcast episode, I think, for you guys to listen to that kind of correlates with today's, which was podcast 11, limitations and when to push things in your dog's training, whatever. So somebody commented on it and said, it feels really good to be told it's okay for your dog to have limitations. There is so much pressure to have the perfect dog that can deal with anything you throw at them. I know some of it's self-made, maybe even a lot of it is, but it's hard. Determining the cost and benefit of the dog and everyone around the dog definitely resonated. Thanks for the podcast. <clears throat> And I commented back because I like that comment a lot. And I said, I think it's important to take a step back and breathe sometimes and mm -hmm. be okay with some of the imperfections. Obviously, we want to keep moving forward, but we still have to love our dog for who they are as we do so. That is such an important part that is so often mislooked through the training process, right? Mm -hmm. Is accepting your dog's flaws while still being conscious of working through them because you could so often fall into this trap as you're applying structure, you're doing all these things to try to make the dog's behavior and you're constantly looking at, you were too excited getting off the bat. I got to stop you from doing that. You're, you were this and you were that. You know what I mean? Yep. And you could fall into this trap of it's like, you just don't even like your dog. <laughs> yeah. you, know, you know what yeah. I mean? Like, like yes, Vinny does things at 140% energy level sometimes and it annoys me sometimes, <laughs> right? Yeah. But... The, I've said this so many times on this podcast. The second I accepted that he's a Malinois, right? He is bred to do things with 140% energy, right? Mm -hmm. And I have some control over that, but in other places, I don't. And the second I accepted that, it was like placebo effect. It's like I stopped even looking at those flaws, and I just developed such a better relationship with him because of that. Yeah. I, I can't agree more. So this was all, this whole conversation is just spun off of that video we watched and the, the expectation that okay means you still need to be calm. No, it doesn't, right? Okay no. means you can be the dog that you are. <laughs> there are still rules, right? Yeah. It's not like because you're free, you could literally do whatever you want to do. Yeah. Again, you can't get into my trash can. You can't do these things, obviously. Mm -mm. But those are always the rules, right? Mm -hmm. But past what the rules always are, you are free to do anything you want to do. Look at it like this is this is actually a really bad example. I was gonna say, but look at it like when you had like when you had recess at school. Okay. Right. Recess at school meant go have fun for an hour. Yeah. Do anything you want to do right now. Mm -hmm. Have as much energy as you want, but just because you're energetic doesn't mean that you could go and spray paint the side of the wall, right? <laughs> yeah. Or go and light the, the playground on fire or, or do shit like that. Like those are rules all the time. <laughs> yeah. But outside of that, do whatever the fuck you want to do. You're okay is your dog's recess. Yep. So whatever. Mic drop. <laughs> so that's it. I thought that was a really good conversation um, no, that's great. to kind of have on this today. I think that it's, 
I think that was a, a really interesting topic. And it's, it's a hard one for me to verbalize. Like I like, it's like finding myself as I was talking about it. I was like, how do I explain this in a more clear way? Yeah. You know what I mean? Because it's like, to me, it's, it's so, it's such a simple concept, right? And if I were able to sit down with somebody and like they hired me for training, I could explain it more clearly because I could explain it using examples they're seeing. You know what I mean? Like Mm -hmm. with their dog, I could sit down with this person and we could go take the dog somewhere and we could watch the dog's behavior, Mm -hmm. right? And and we could actually talk about, hey, that you doing that thing there is unnecessary or confusing. This is why, right? Or that thing you're doing over there, just let the dog be a dog. This is why. You know what I mean? But we yeah. can't do that a lot of times in some of these situations with people through the internet. Mm-hmm. So I've got to find ways to be able to like articulate it <laughs> where it's it's more, it, it like resonates a little bit more. Yeah. You know? Sure. And I just encourage everybody to just, if you are doing things in this type of way right now, right? Meaning the way that I don't necessarily agree with, just take a couple steps back and really analyze your dog's behavior and just mm-hmm. throw the commands out the window for a minute and just ask yourself, what do you want the dog to do or not want the dog to do? Yeah. Right? If you want the dog to do something, do not use a release. Use a command that has a clear and consistent meaning that you can hold them accountable for. Yeah. If you don't want the dog to do something, don't use a command. <laughs> Just correct the dog. Yep. Easy peasy. What do you Simplify. Think, Josh? Simplify. No, I, <clears throat> I, I think that's great because I don't think we've ever really talked about how to combat energy levels, you know? Mm-hmm. And it makes sense that a lot of people would be <laughs> struggling with that, especially like in this scenario that we've kind of been talking about where it's just like you're trying to do things one or two different ways. So, mm-hmm. yeah, the dog can never, like like you said, like with Vinny at the park, you know, it's like, how was he ever going to figure out what was the wrong thing? Because he's like, this is what we always did. You know, this was our thing. Yeah, it, it takes the responsibility away from the dog and it puts it on the owner, right? Because like, let's yeah. let's paint that exact scenario out. And let's say I didn't take any responsibility myself for like, what can I do to shift the association? And I just yeah. said, your behavior right now is inappropriate. Yeah. But I still went there, trained all these high drive things, did all this really energetic stuff. But every time I went there and I tried to release him because I did that, he was all jacked up and I just kept correcting him for it. Yeah, like, just burning that doesn't make any sense. No. It makes no sense. And it's so un unfair on the dog in that moment, right? Yeah. In a lot of cases, when we release our dog from a bed, here, here's a situation that happens a lot with people at home, right? They have their dog in a bed stay, right? And maybe they want the dog to release calmly. So they release them off the bed and the dog gets excited to say, no, boom, right? And correct them for it. But as soon as they release them, the guests are like, oh my God, dog, ah, blah, 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 and they just get the dog super fucking jacked up, mm-hmm. right? But we're putting the responsibility on the dog instead of the people. If we really yeah. care about the energy level, we have to stop that. Because yeah. that's why the dog is getting so amped up to get off of the bed. Oh, yeah. You know yeah. what I mean? Mm-hmm. Like, you got to look at things that way. You mm-hmm. have to. Yeah. I think a lot of the times, honestly, it's not the dog's fault. Yeah. <laughs> God. Oh, shit. Um, and we don't have time to talk about this today, but <laughs> I'm, I got to write this down on my notebook because yeah, that, write it down. that exact thing, there's a, there's a dog situation I want to talk about uh, uh, next time. Also, God, we got a lot of things to talk about. We got our next couple podcast episodes lined up here. There we go. Oh yeah, write them down. Here too. <laughs> Hold on. Um, that that perfectly embodies the the. <sighs> we have to we have to take more responsibility for our dog's behavior. Yeah. We are so much more in control of of our dogs than we think, right? Mm -hmm. And the more we look at reverse engineering of what am I doing that's contributing to the problem, the more successful you're going to be with things, you know? And and the most successful clients we have are the ones that come in and they say, what can I change? Mm -hmm. What can I change? Mm. Not do this, fix my dog. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah, fix the dog. So that's going to be our segue into our topic for next week for sure. I'm excited for that. Yeah. That was a good one. Yeah. And keep those YouTube comments coming. Jeez. Keep them coming, guys. Those are, that's, it's been insanely crazy to see. I feel like we've turned that leaf, you know, this year. It's just been like views, comments, like actual, 
actual discourse in in our comment thread. It's been really I love cool. It. Yeah, it's been nice to see. So keep it up, everybody. Yeah. Tell your friends. Summertime in Cleveland, guys. Get ready to start seeing a little more leg on the podcast. <laughs> oh, you got it up there? <laughs> Maybe, Get ready. You, hey, you know what we've been talking about for two years? What's that? Doing one outside on the patio. We're gonna, we'll make it happen. We're doing it this year. All right, everybody hear it. You, you heard it here first. You, you're going to hear birds chirping. <laughs> <laughs> we'll literally have a third mic out. That's just the ambient mic. It'll catch all the ambient noises. <laughs> yeah. Oh, my gosh. Perfect. I love that. Well, I think- all right, guys. Well, that's what we got for you today. Yep. Hope you liked it. And uh, we'll catch you on the next one. Have a great day. Bye. Bye.